Constellations. How many of you took this course to learn the constellations? One. Sucks to be you. Uh, <laughs> even I don't know all the constellations. In fact, I probably only know like six or seven constellations. And I'm a real honest to goodness astronomer. So there's a reason why I can actually be a professional astronomer and not know the constellations. But back in, and we'll get to that reason in a second, but back in the day, astronomers knew the constellations. So there's a very practical reason for knowing the constellations. Anyone want to venture a guess? Navigation. So um, if you're sailing a ship, knowing the constellations and the stars and having an understanding of the sky was crucial. We all know there's one star that kind of points to the north always. We call that star what? Polaris. You can navigate off of it. Uh, even if you don't see Polaris, if you're in the southern hemisphere, if you understand how the stars are moving, the various constellations, you can use it for navigation of ships. But uh, astronomers aren't, weren't uh, called on to go on every sea voyage to help keep the ship uh, where it need, you know, on the path it needed to go. Astronomers need to understand the constellations for a reason, too. We, uh, that's right, we, so uh, she said we use them as a calendar, and we'll get to that, particularly as we begin lesson two, you'll see, uh, it, going back to even prehistory, uh, the stars and objects in the sky were used as a basic uh, calendar as well. But just to be a practicing astronomer, it's useful to know the constellations, because suppose, suppose um, one of these stars here was acting up, I don't know, let me pick one. Maybe this little star right there. Maybe it's getting brighter and fainter and brighter and fainter. As an astronomer, you know, most people don't care, but as an astronomer, I'm excited. Maybe it's going to blow up. Maybe who knows what it's going to do. And I want to report that to my colleagues uh, elsewhere around so they can actually look at the star and confirm that I'm not crazy. And maybe uh, you know, their observations and insight can add to it, the process of discovery. But I've got to communicate where that star is in the sky. So an easy way to do it is say, well, first go to the constellation. What constellation is this? Orion. And then go to the belt. Go to the, the, the kind of the top of the belt. And then go diagonal from that topmost star towards the blue star in the foot, Rigel. The big blue star is Rigel. The big red star is Betelgeuse. So go in, in the direction of Rigel just a, a little bit. And there's the star I'm talking about. So it's a way to navigate the sky, uh, let others know uh, that there's something important going on there. So, but nowadays, you know, that was useful back then, but nowadays we don't navigate the sky that way, um, particularly because often we're looking at stars that are too faint to even see with the human eye, and sometimes we're navigating the sky in wavelengths that the human eye doesn't even work at, like radio or x-ray or gamma ray. So, in the modern era, we have to rely on what? What do we call it? to navigate the sky, and GPS, that's not, it's, well, it's actually very much related. Uh, GPS is giving us what? Coordinates, yeah. And so astronomers have a coordinate system for the sky, just like on Earth we have a coordinate system that the GPS uses, and the two are intimately related. So here's a globe, and so this is a representation of the Earth, and there's a coordinate system on it. You may not be able to see it from your distance, but there are lines going around it this way and lines going on it this way, two-dimensional grid on the surface of the sphere, and we call that a coordinate system. What are the two coordinates called on the globe? Latitude and longitude. Uh, which one runs from pole to pole? No, latitude. Yeah, latitude changes up here, it's plus 90. Down here it's minus 90, and you have 360 degrees going around the, the Earth in this direction. Well, we can do the same thing for the stars in the sky. It's based upon our lack of understanding of distance. Like when you look up at the sky at night, can you see how far the stars are from us? No. You know, we have no idea how far they're away. Distance is the hardest thing to measure in astronomy. Uh, we have to use all sorts of tricks to figure out distances. Just looking at the sky, we have no comprehension of distance or that some stars are farther away than others. They all appear to be kind of at the same distance. In fact, this is what uh, the ancient models, cosmological models, uh, assume. <laughs> the ancient models assume Earth is sitting here at the center, and then around it there is a sphere. They didn't think of the stars as distributed through three-dimensional space. They thought there was a sphere that encompassed, enclosed the Earth. They called it the celestial sphere. It's still useful today as a mental construct. When we're trying to talk about how the sky appears to move, 
If you're standing underneath it, we often talk about the celestial sphere, even today. But imagine the sphere encircling the earth, and you can do that. Since we can't see distance, we can pretend they're all at the same distance, painted onto this sphere. And, you know, the, 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 you know, back then they thought the earth was standing still, and the sphere would actually go around the earth. The whole universe would go around us. Nowadays we know that, um, well, under the idea of the sphere, the universe is out there, and we're rotating underneath it. makes the appearance of motion of these stars. But that aside, imagine taking the coordinate system of the Earth, the longitude latitude coordinate system, and projecting it out, kind of from the center of the Earth, radially outward onto the celestial sphere, and then fixing it to the sphere. As I just said, uh, you can envision the Earth standing still and the sphere moving, or you can envision the sphere standing still and the Earth moving, but in either case, the longitude-latitude coordinate system is fixed to the Earth. This other coordinate system is fixed to the sky. And uh, we don't call those coordinates longitude and latitude, but what do we call them if we're talking about the sky? Declination and right ascension. So let's um, make a note here. This is um, coordinate systems. So on the Earth, we have longitude, longitude, latitude. And on the sky, we have, um, which one corresponds to longitude? Right ascension or declination? Right ascension. It's a weird you know, term, but that's what it's called. You can just think of it as longitude for the sky. Latitude, we call that declination. When fixed to the sky. Now, uh, so let's uh, write down the ranges here. Whether it's longitude or whether it's right ascension, we have 360 degrees going around the sphere. So 0 to 360 degrees. And latitude, we go from minus 90 degrees in the south pole, whether it's the south pole of the Earth with latitude or the south pole of the celestial sphere, to plus 90 degrees at the north pole. So here's a, oops, a figure to illustrate that. So just as I was kind of waving about with my hands here, we got the Earth in the middle. This mental idea construct of the sphere encompassing us, and we have coordinates on it. We, we've attached that. You can see the longitude latitude coordinate system. You can see projected and drawn on the sky. Now they rotate with respect to each other, but the one on the sphere rotates with the sphere and with the stars that are painted on the sphere. So the stars are kind of fixed with respect to it. And you can see the numbers here. We got the pole up here to be plus 90 declination plus 60, plus 30. Zero is the celestial equator, which is just a projection of Earth's equator onto the celestial sphere. Going down, we got minus 30, and then below, we can't see it, minus 30, I'm sorry, minus 60, and then minus 90 is the south celestial pole, just like we call that the south pole. This is the south celestial pole, north pole, north celestial pole. And going around the celestial sphere, and longitude goes from zero to 360 degrees. Right ascension, can also be described that way, 0 to 360 degrees. Though there's kind of a convention in astronomy that the right ascension, instead of using degrees, we use hours. Because in one day, uh, the celestial sphere appears to rotate how many hours? 24, right? Because the Earth is spinning on its axis once every day, once every 24 hours. So from our point of view, it's as if the celestial sphere is spinning around once every 24 hours. So instead of using degrees, uh, historic convention is to use hours. So if there's a star above you at one hour right ascension, in, in an hour, the stars at two hours right ascension will be above you. In another hour, the stars at three hours right ascension will be above you. So we just uh, use hours. It's kind of convenient. So right ascension can be 0 to 360 degrees, or 0 hours to 24 hours. And then 24 hours is the same as 0 hours. Now, we're not going to make use of that in this course, though if you're taking the lab and you're scheduling observations on Skynet using the prompt telescopes or some of the other Skynet telescopes, there are boxes where you input the right ascension and declination. Though, it also makes it easy. We do live in the modern era. If you want to look at Jupiter, you don't have to go to some book and look up the coordinates of Jupiter at this point in time. You just type in Jupiter, and Skynet will look up the coordinates for you. So you can actually go through the labs without having too deep of an understanding of right ascension declination. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of it right now, at least for those of you in the labs. But it's a coordinate system. Okay. 
So that was a tangent. Let's get back to oh question. So the question is, is the coordinate system with respect to Earth? If we went to a different planet, would we need a different coordinate system? And the answer is yes and no. It depends. Uh, the stars are so, so far away that if we hop from Earth to the Moon, or to Mars, or to anything in the solar system, the, the distant stars aren't going to appear to shift hardly at all because they're just so far away. Now, maybe the nearby stars like Alpha Centauri might shift a little bit. In fact, uh, we see shift of its position when Earth moves from one side of its orbit to the other. It's a parallax effect, something we'll get to a little bit later. Now, if we were to go to different stars, then yeah, you know, particularly far away in the galaxy, then all the stars will appear to shift their position. So it really is a, an Earth-based system. Good question. Okay, constellations. So, oh, another question. Good. Is the celestial equator different from the ecliptic? And the answer is yes. The ecliptic is the plane of our solar system. So you can see here the globe. Our, our Earth is tipped just a little bit. Um, it's because, well, when we formed, let's say this is the plane of the solar system, the desk, the sun is maybe my laptop. When Earth formed, it was almost certainly pointed straight up and down, all the planets were. But the early solar system was a mess. We probably formed twice as many planets as we have nowadays. We have had a lot of collisions. Earth was probably struck by something about the size of Mars in its early history, tipped it over, and um, some of the debris that came off formed the moon. And the way it works gravitationally, the moon holds its this tip in, in place. It can't tip back or tip in some other direction. Anyway, if we take the equator of the Earth and project it off into space, that's the celestial equator. The table is the ecliptic, the plane of the solar system. So there is a difference. They're tipped with each other with, uh, by currently 23 and a half degrees. The Earth wobbles a little bit over thousands of years, so it's anywhere between 23 and 24 degrees. Other questions? Just good questions. Okay. So what? Well, constellations, yeah. So let me try to wrap up constellations here. Uh, for those of you who took the course, hoping to learn the constellations and learn the stories behind them, that's all good stuff. But since I only know like six constellations or seven or so, I'm not the one to teach you that. And it's better to take maybe an anthropology course if we offer one. Probably don't. But uh, the, the constellations tell you more about the culture. Like here, there's a collection of stars. And Western civilization looked at this collection of stars and saw a guy beating a dead animal. And uh, we have other cultures would see different things and did see different things. And it also depends on where you are on the globe. For example, if I look at Orion now, if I go outside, as winter approaches, Orion will come up and I'll see this collection of stars that I might envision as a, a hunter. And to me, it looks more like an hourglass, but they envision a full hunter and everything. But uh, if I get in, I've actually done this. I've gotten in a plane and I've flown to Chile. And this is a mid-latitude constellation. You can see it from the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. What happens as I'm flying to Chile to this constellation? What does it appear to do? Yeah, it appears to flip over. In reality, I'm flipping over. I start out standing up, uh, you know, up like this, looking at the constellation. By the time I get to Chile, I'm upside down. So from my point of view, the constellation is standing on its head. And then, it, you know, it, people, in, you know, people see um, in random patterns, we see people and faces in particular all the time. It's like a psychologically proven thing. Have you ever, like, stared at a rug or a strange... Uh, uh, like if I stare here, I'll, maybe I'll start to see it. Or you know, patterns and tiles on the ceiling or something like bored to death and just staring at the wall. Do you see like faces and people? And, or is it just like my problem or something? <laughs> anyway, the brain is uh, hardwired to see people. And we tend to see them standing straight up. And then see faces and we see them straight up. So if I flip this constellation, you may no longer see. And the people in the southern hemisphere never envisioned a person standing on their head. They have different ways of connecting the dots and see different things. The moon's another good example where it changes with hemisphere. Um, have you all seen the face of the moon? Yes, I, I, I'm telling you, the brain sees faces and things. Uh, programmed to. But if we go to the southern hemisphere, the moon is upside down. 
Actually, it's the same, we are upside down, so we're looking at the moon standing on our head. So the splotches that make the face of the moon are now upside down, and, and people in the southern hemisphere don't know what you're saying when you say the face of the moon. They're like, what, I've, I've never seen a face in the moon. Okay, I don't know what's going on here. Come on. Okay. So they're interesting culturally, but they don't have great physical meaning. Here's another way to see the lack of physical meaning in these constellations. So if we're standing on Earth looking at that collection of stars, it looks like Orion from our point of view. But if we were get, to get off the Earth and move like a thousand light years over here and look at it from the side, the stars all occupy different positions. It goes back to your question about, is this coordinate system only Earth-based? And it is. If we look from a different point of view, these nearby stars appear in completely different positions. Now, we can't see distance, but they're all at different distances, and if we get to the side, we'd notice that. It doesn't look like a hunter at all in this orientation. Also, through great spans of time, the stars move around. Uh, they're, they're moving through space. We're all kind of going around the center of the galaxy, and we're traveling together, so there's not too much motion, but there's a little bit of motion star to star, because they're attracting each other gravitationally, and stars outside of this area are pulling them gravitationally, so they kind of wander with respect to each other, and the constellations get distorted over thousands and tens of thousands of years. In a long enough period of time, we'll have to come up with new ways to connect all the dots. Any questions about constellations?